Okay. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to get to this yesterday. I really, really wanted to. I just, I was, I got home really late and I, uh, it was a long day and I just didn't have it in me uh, to go through this. But now I can. There is now a massive uh, pro war fever in America. Uh, not pro war when it comes to the average person, but if you look across American media, and Washington and all the politicians, the war drums, they are beaten once again. And for some reason, the elites have decided that uh, now that the orange man, Putin's enabler, is out of office and we've got the great uh, war hawk, Joe Biden, and I don't say that unironically, or I don't say that ironically, I mean that totally unironically. Joe Biden is a great war hawk, he always has been. Uh, if not for Joe Biden, we wouldn't have had the Iraq war. He could have put a stop to it if he wanted to. He chose rather to do his level best in his position to uh, make sure that the Iraq war happened. And so, he, you know, he's somebody who I consider to be firmly within the school of thought. Um, I guess you would call this uh, the Jonah Goldberg school, um, named after uh, because of uh, Jonah Goldberg's uh, famous quote, uh, about the Iraq War, that uh, you know, sometimes to be to be the world superpower, uh, you got to um, you got to go knock over a couple a country every once in a while, and and really uh, make an example of them to remind everyone that you're in charge or something to that effect. I can't remember the exact words of Jonah Goldberg, but that was his justification basically for the Iraq War. That well, we just had to do it because even if the, you know all the reasons that we officially gave were were bunk. And that you know, the whole WMD thing and Saddam colluding with Al Qaeda to, you know, commit 9/11, all that sure that sure that was made up. But we had to set an example by taking out uh, Saddam in Iraq. We had to make that country into into a hell, um, to prove that we're still in charge. And so, by golly, it's been too long since America's had a good war. And people are starting to doubt our strength. You see, the Chinese, they're ascendant. And the Chinese think, oh, gee, and, and people around the world are saying, wow, China's the next great superpower. America's on its way out. Well, Joe Biden's got to show uh, the world what for by picking a fight with old Vlad Putin Putin over some phony uh, war to recapture and reclaim uh, the Ukraine. Which is, I mean, if Putin all of a sudden has decided it's time to capture the Ukraine, I don't know where he's been for the last uh, six years, I believe it was, back in 2015 when there was when the war in Ukraine first started. Putin didn't want a whole lot to do with it. Um, sure, he seized Crimea because that's where he had a naval base. But other than that, once he had his base, uh, Putin, as far as his way of thinking, he seemed to be pretty satisfied. There was a lot of popular support in Russia for helping uh, the separatists in uh, in uh, um, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, um, but Putin clearly was not that interested. Uh, he kind of did the bare minimum that he had to politically, so that he didn't look weak in his own country. Um, but those country, those two oblasts, they voted to join Russia, and Putin turned them down. He did not want to annex those those oblasts. Uh, he only wanted to annex Crimea because that's where uh, their naval base is. And so Putin doesn't seem to be too ideologically committed to invading and reconquering the Ukraine when he had the opportunity to take two oblasts from Ukraine. He turned them down. And that's why those uh, Donetsk and Luhansk to this day still kind of are in a – they're in a, a limbo. They're neither Russian nor Ukraine. And yet we're supposed to believe that Putin is on the verge of invading and, and marching into Kiev? And taking the whole country, even the western half that hates his guts, you know, the people who very, very much out in, the, in western Ukraine do not like Russians one bit. Why now of all times? Is it just because Putin thinks Biden is so uniquely weak that he, all these things that he never dreamed of doing uh, when Obama and Trump were president, now all of a sudden Putin feels empowered? And so Biden has to toughen up and say, no, I'm going to uh, don't don't cross that line, Vlad, and he has to be tough. And, and you've got Republican senators. Uh, on Fox News talking about a nuclear first strike to defend uh, a, a country that most Americans could not find on a map. And I don't mean that in an insulting way. I mean that in a 
Ukraine has nothing to do with our lives sort of way, much in the same way that uh, you know the Central African Republic, what goes on there has nothing to do with our lives. Um, you know, to what I understand, yeah, there's some, there's a sad war going on there, or at least there was at a certain time. Lots of people get killed. Also, a war over in Ethiopia. Uh, there's wars all over the world, all the time, and they're sad. People die. That's not a good thing. But uh, you don't see Republican senators going on TV and uh, refusing to rule out a nuclear first strike. And so, even if uh, old Pooty Poo Putin wanted to march right into Ukraine, conquer the whole country, um, which, you know, I mean, to me, I, I think that he would be, it would not be very, he would not be 100% uh, successful because there's a lot of people in that country who don't like him and who would resist occupation. Uh, you know, I think that's, that part's pretty clear. There's a pretty strong, uh, uh, there's a pretty strong contingent of the population in Ukraine uh, who would not take kindly <laughs> to, uh, to Russian rule. So I, I don't think that it would be a smart move uh, of Putin to do that, which is probably the main reason, you know, just in, that combined with his past behavior, his past reluctance um, to intervene and in, or to to formally annex parts of Ukraine um, when he had the opportunity. And this all would seem to suggest that uh, he's not about to invade the country. They say, oh, well, tr Putin, he's moving around uh, troops, right? On, on Ukraine's border. It's like, oh, you mean Ukraine's border with Russia? Russia's moving troops around inside of Russia? The U.S. moves troops around all the time. We're moving troops around on, you know, on our southern border. Is there, it, it, do, you, do you expect uh, China to start spouting off and saying, oh, look at this. Uh, uh, Biden must be stopped or Trump must be stopped. They're moving troops around right on Mexico's doorstep. They're about to invade. It would be patently absurd that anyone would be upset about that. You know, U.S. can do whatever they want with troops in their own country. Hell, the U.S. feels like it can move troops anywhere around in the world where it wants, and nobody should have, should care about it. Uh, you know, the U.S. feels that they should be able to sail their ships uh, in the Pacific Ocean right up to China, and China's just supposed to, you know, be, that's supposed to be perfectly okay. Nobody's supposed to feel intimidated about that. If the Chinese get offended by the U.S. sailing their ships right up to their right up to their border, you know, right on China's doorstep, uh, China's the one who's wrong if they feel if they feel bad about that. But if Russia's moving troops around inside of Russia, near its borders, you know, because typically, uh, you know, the the point of having a military, if you're not an imperial power, is to defend your country from invaders, and so it would make sense that. Your, your military would be near the border. It's kind of where you would need them if you ever actually needed to use the military. If the military ever had to be you know, activated and actually called into combat, you would think it would be on your border. And so this whole situation really just is so stupid. There's nothing more I can say. I mean, they do this every few years. They say, oh my gosh, Russia's going to... Um, I forget the, the, the last thing they did where they, the, Russia was you know, moving troops around. And they said, oh my gosh, Russia's going to invade the Baltics. They're going to annex the Baltic republics. And of course, that never happened. But we're supposed to get upset about this every few years. Every time. We're just supposed to act like it's somehow out of the ordinary or strange or you know beyond the pale that Russian troops are moving inside of Russia. And even if it did mean what they're saying with their meaning, we're supposed to care. Ordinary people do not care. Doesn't matter. Doesn't affect them. If... Uh, Lithuania, which I believe Lithuania is the, the real bad one as far as the, I mean, all, I'm sure all, all of you are pretty much as terrible on the Wu flu stuff, but um, assuming Lithuania is the one that has completely unpersoned all of the unvaccinated people and, and, turn, and just made them homeless and made it so they can't work, they can't go to stores, they have to, you know, uh, buy food on the black market, um, that country, if that uh, totalitarian hellhole was annexed by Russia. I don't think anybody would really care in the U.S., nor would we notice a totalitarian hellhole. Uh, I, I mean, if anything, maybe uh, Russia's probably, if I had to guess, Russia's probably more kind to the unvaccinated people uh, than Lithuania. So even though, you know, in my opinion, Russia's not great, I wouldn't want to live in Russia, um, might be a net benefit <laughs> to some of these countries if they got annexed by Russia, but that's not going to happen. It never has happened. They always say it's going to happen. 
Oh, and here's the other thing. Those Baltic states, I mean, at least you could make the argument, well, they're a part of NATO, so we should defend them, even though NATO shouldn't exist because the Cold War is over. Um, Ukraine's not even a part of NATO. They're not a part of the EU. They're not a part of anything. Ukraine is the furthest east you know, and south in Europe that you can get you know, while still being Europe and not you know, Russia. In other words, it doesn't matter. It's not like you have a bunch of free people who are about to lose their freedom or something like that. It is a sectarian conflict. You've got bad guys that run Ukraine. You've got bad guys that run Russia. It used to be that there were different bad guys who were friendlier to Russia that ruled Ukraine. And then the CIA uh, and the State Department overthrew uh, those bad guys and replaced them with other bad guys who were just pro-NATO. Um, so you've got, pro, you've got pro-Putin uh, bad guys who were replaced by pro-Washington bad guys uh, who are both very corrupt and not great. Not good guys, really, on, on either side. I mean, they're not the worst people in the world. You know, none of them are Hitler, but none of them are, you know, Thomas Jefferson either. They're basically a bunch of gangsters. And so I'm sure anybody who listens to this channel um, is not going to allow themselves to be riled up by this nonsense. But, you know, if you hear other people who are getting excited about this, try and talk them down off the ledge. You know, just ask them simple questions like, hey, why... Why does what happens in Ukraine matter? Also, why is it all of a sudden, I mean, it, it might be a little hard to explain the history of the recent history of the war in Ukraine and how Russia had the chance to annex um, parts of eastern Ukraine and chose not to. and only chose to annex the part where their naval base was that was threatened uh, by the coup. Um, that might be a little harder to, to explain to people and to talk about, you know, if, unless you have a you know a deeper background about it. But just ask them, why, is this, why does this matter? Why should we get into a, a war with a nuclear power? Because when you get into a war with a nuclear power, that's a nuclear war. And you've got senators on TV talking about a first strike, which is not good. That should always be off the table. A nuclear first strike should always be off the table. You know, he says, oh, well, when you're dealing with the enemy, you can never leave anything off the table. It's like, no, that, that should be off the table because you, then you're the one starting the nuclear war. You don't do that. You don't want that on your hands. So this isn't fun and games. This isn't Saddam Hussein. You know, uh, G George Bush Sr., back in 1991, the public media perception was that he was weak. He didn't want to look weak. So what did he do? He went and he found an excuse to go attack Saddam Hussein. And because he knew, you know, Saddam was weak and couldn't fight back. And so that's what he did. And then he said, I'm a tough guy. See, I took down the next Hitler because he thought it'd be easy. Biden probably, because he looks weak because of, excuse me, stepped, kicked something. Um, he, he looks weak because of all the stuff with Hunter and, and China and, and all these things. He looks compromised. He's publicly perceived as being a weak man. If he goes and, you know, kicks, uh, kicks dust up with Putin, he's trying to puff his chest out and look tough because he thinks, oh, well, Russia, you know, they're just so weak, maybe. I mean, maybe, I think that's the thing. I don't know how you could think that Russia is very tough or I think that they just use Russia as a punching bag because it, they're an easy target because people remember oh in the past Russia was was big threat um, and they're not now you know they're completely destitute and I don't say that gleefully but I mean you know it was 70 years of communism will do a number on your society and so you know now that that period is over uh, the focus should be on trying to help you know Russia build move on and uh, you know build itself back up as a uh, non-communist nation, and yet the the West, the Washington, uh, has been bound to determine to do the exact opposite. Um, you know, Russia should be you know, like a positive. I mean, Russia is kind of the best case scenario for what China will look like uh, after a while, because you don't want the communists to be in charge in China forever. Right? Communists kind of scary. They're bad guys. They're a lot worse than Putin. And if they weren't scarier, then I don't think you would have Biden, you know, trying to act tough with all Putin because he wouldn't do this with China. And by the way, Putin's got a lot more nukes than China. In an actual war, Putin is a much bigger threat than China. It's much more dangerous to go to war with uh, with Russia. Russia's got enough nukes, so does the U.S., to uh, obliterate the entire planet like 15 times or 40 times or whatever. It's an insane amount. They have you know, between the U.S. and Russia. 
Um, it's it's un it's undeniable. There would be the end of humanity. And so, I mean, I almost have more. I almost am less offended by the people who uh, um, talk about the possibility of a war with China, even though that would also be catastrophic. Uh, it would be apocalyptic uh, for the human race. But China's nuclear arsenal, from what I understand, I mean, they could be keeping a lot of secret, but from what I understand, Russia is still dwarfs China's nuclear arsenal. So really, none of these people, I mean, if you even, I, it's one thing to talk about it. I don't want to say, like, words should be forbidden. But, I mean, to seriously consider this, this is, uh, I don't know how you can, how, uh, if, if words can be violence, I don't know how any words could be more violence than suggesting nuclear war. Or war with a country that is nuclear armed, because that means you're suggesting nuclear war. Anyone who promotes the idea of the U.S., you know, going to war with a country like Russia or China, um is somebody who should be nowhere near uh, positions of power in this country. Because they're not serious. You can't be a serious person and consider things like that. Um, I mean, it, it, it should be so far from your mind. The first priority of any real statesman should be to befriend every nuclear power around the planet. We should be able to count every nuclear power as an ally on this planet. And those who can't be counted on as allies uh, or friends, th your top priority should be making peace, a lasting peace, and, and, and building a friendship with those countries. So with that said, I will see you folks back here tomorrow. I think I mean that for sure this time. I will try not to – I don't think I'll be running late tomorrow like I was uh, yesterday. It's an unusual occurrence. So that will be all for now.